This is the pathetic story of Forler Shade. The name Forler Shade originates from the Yoruba culture of Nigeria and carries a deeply symbolic meaning. In Yoruba tradition, names often hold significant cultural and spiritual significance, reflecting the hopes, aspirations, or characteristics desired for the individual bearing the name. Fihorlar Shade, which literally means use wealth as a thing of dignity, can be broken down into two parts. Fihorlar, this element of the name Horlar means honor or wealth in the Yoruba language. It represents qualities such as dignity, respect, and integrity. Shade part signifies crown or royalty in Yoruba. It symbolizes greatness, excellence, and the highest level of achievement. Therefore, when combined, Fihorlar Shade conveys the powerful message that honor or wealth brings about a crown or royalty. It suggests that through demonstrating integrity, dignity, and respect, one can attain greatness and be worthy of recognition and honor. In essence, the name Forler Shade embodies the idea that honorable behavior and noble qualities are rewarded with the highest forms of recognition and respect akin to wearing a crown of distinction and honor. Shade is a short form of Forler Shade, but neither her parents bear any name that remotely belongs to the Yoruba-speaking part of Nigeria. The story begins on Monday, April 1st. That's when 19-year-old Shade Robinson was first reported missing on Tuesday. On the 2nd of April, Shade's car was found burnt near 30th in Lisbon on Milwaukee's north side. That same day, a severed leg was found at Warnemont Park in Cut to Hay, 11 miles from Shade's burnt car. Milwaukee investigators noted the leg had pink nail polish and appeared to have been severed by a saw. There were multiple cutting impressions around the area of the leg that was cut off. It had a sharp force trauma on top of the femur bone, which showed it was broken off intentionally with a sharp saw halfway through. The leg was not decomposing by the time they found it. It showed it was recently cut off. That same evening, Shade Robinson's friend reported her missing at about 9 p.m. She worked at Pizza Shuttle Restaurant in Milwaukee, but didn't show up for her shift that day. Her friend told police that Shade's last known location was at Dukes on Waterer, a sports bar near the Milwaukee River. Her Snapchat location was from the day before on April 1st. At the time Shade's friend made that report to the police, investigators were trying to connect the link between the severed leg to a burnt 2020 Honda Civic car they found in the early morning hours of April 2nd. It was found on the north side of Milwaukee at about 7.30 in the morning. Shade's family informed the police that she used the Life360 app that allows users to share their locations with other people. When her friend checked the app, it showed that her phone appeared to be in Warnemont Park around 4.33 a.m. on April 2, 2024. That was the same location where the severed leg was found about 13 hours later. Shade's outing with her date was the first date they ever had and the first time ever that they were together. She was never seen again after that meeting. Investigators later determined the car had been registered to Shade. In the trunk of the car, they found the clothing she was wearing the evening of April 1st, a black puffer coat, light blue ripped jeans and white socks, along with her dark grayish brown purse and her iPhone. Welcome back to Crime in Prison. Today we're looking at the story of Shade Robinson and Maxwell Anderson and how she was brutally eliminated. By the way, Crime in Prison is a collection of narratives that delve into the world of crime, punishment, and redemption. The best way to support me is by subscribing to the channel and leaving a comment. So if you want to see more stories like this, please hit subscribe. It will really help with the algorithm. Now let's get right down to it. On Thursday, April 4th, the Milwaukee County Sheriff's deputies searched a home on Oklahoma and 39th Street. The residence of that home was Maxwell Anderson. He was taken into custody that day and identified as a person of interest in relation to the severed leg found in Cut to Hate. On Friday, April 5th, sheriff's deputies found more body parts near the same location where Shade's burnt car was found. On Saturday, April 6th, Shade's family searched that same area and found her blanket. 
The hope of her ever returning home alive was completely shattered. Milwaukee police came out to search again and found even more human remains. On Sunday, April 7th, Sade's family went back to search the area and found more human remains again. On Tuesday, April 9th, Anderson went before a Milwaukee County judge where prosecutors asked for an extension to keep him behind bars. That extension was granted that day. Sade's family and friends went back to Warnemont Park again and they found what they believed to be body parts that the sheriff's office needed to investigate further. Surveillance video from nearby CAH High School that faces the park and the shoreline video showed a vehicle heading toward the drop-off location at about 2.53 a.m. on April 2nd. That same morning, the Cahay Water Department reported that someone had rammed a vehicle into the gate. So detectives went to the scene and collected broken pieces from that vehicle. The pieces were determined to belong to a Honda Civic. Sade's phone was subpoena, and her texting information showed a detailed timeline. The data retrieved showed a simple conversation of two people getting together to meet out on a first date. Sade had communicated with the person she was meeting up with detectives. She started off the conversation that day by asking where she and the person would meet. The recipient said he would take a quick shower and meet up with her at 5.15. He asked if Sade was hungry. He said he needed to stop at Twisted Fisherman to pick up something from last year. He said they could eat there first. They agreed on having seafood. Sade and Maxwell Anderson met up for a first date at Twisted Fisherman in Milwaukee. Maxwell worked there as a bartender. A staff of Twisted Fisherman confirmed Maxwell was a staff when the police interrogated the staff of the establishment. He said Maxwell told them he was meeting a lady on a first date there. Surveillance video from Twisted Fisherman showed Maxwell entered the restaurant at 5.09 p.m. on April 1st. Eleven minutes after he got there, Sade walked in and sat next to him. Both of them left at 6.24 p.m. Sade's phone showed that after they left Twisted Fisherman, they went to the area near Dukes on Water, the same place her friends saw as her Snapchat location. Sade's phone went from there to a residential area in southwest Milwaukee. The phone pinged in the exact location of Maxwell Anderson. S. Home hours after the phone pinged at Warnemont Park where the severed leg was later discovered. Maxwell Anderson was caught on bus surveillance video in the area near the burning car just after it was first reported. He was wearing the exact clothing depicted on the subject fleeing the scene of the vehicle arson, including the large tan backpack with tan straps. On April 4th, Investigators took Maxwell into custody at a traffic stop and executed a search warrant for his home. Inside the house, investigated found blood on the bed in one of the bedrooms and on the walls leading toward the basement. The found several gasoline containers in the garage storage area. Two days after, on the 6th of April, the investigators find a human foot and flesh in northwest Milwaukee where Shade's burning car was recovered days before. Investigators determined this foot and the leg found at Warnemont Park appeared to be from the same individual particularly due to skin tone, size as well as the same pink nail polish. Maxwell was finally charged on April 12th, and the charges that he faces right now are first-degree intentional homicide mutilating a corpse and then arson. Who is he? Maxwell Anderson, a 33-year-old resident of the South Side resided at 39th and Oklahoma. He had connections to Waukesha County and had a varied educational background, attending Kettle Moraine Catholic Memorial and Pewaukee High Schools in the early 2000s. Anderson's history included brushes with the law, notably a misdemeanor disorderly conduct conviction in Waukesha County in 2014 stemming from an incident involving a family member in Delafield. Additionally, he had a misdemeanor domestic violence conviction in 2015. Anderson had experience working at several bars in Milwaukee, including a stint at the Rave from 2018 to 2020. His most recent employment was at Victor's Nightclub on the East Side, where he worked full-time. A lady who testified to law enforcement said she was once invited to his home. Her narration of an account of an encounter with Anderson gave a glimpse into the kind of person he is. She said she met Anderson once in fall, 
and he invited her to his south side home. She said she saw a hole in the yard and asked Anderson about it. Anderson said he was building a garden. When she got in, it was like he was in the middle of a lot of renovations that didn't seem like it was going to finish anytime soon. He asked her if she wanted to see his basement after he gave her a little of the house, but she declined. Anderson said okay, and proceeded to say it was creepy down there in his basement. She insisted she didn't want to see the basement. Multiple law enforcement sources say Anderson had what is described as an intimate dungeon in his basement. Maxwell Anderson was arrested and still in jail. He is set to appear on Monday for his preliminary hearing for now. He's being held on $5 million. We will keep you updated on the story of Sade. The book of Proverbs states that the wicked will never go unpunished. Thank you for staying with me till the end of the story. What are your thoughts on this entire case? Please share your opinions in the comments section below. If you appreciated our efforts, don't forget to like this video and share it with others. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so now and stay connected with Crime in Prison. By subscribing, you'll receive notifications for more compelling stories like this one. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video with another true crime story.